The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, on the 7th of December 1941, involved not only Japanese aircraft but also submarines. Nine large fleet submarines were operating around the Hawaiian Islands during the aerial attack, including launching two man midget submarines that penetrated the Pearl Harbor defenses some hours before the carrier airstrikes began. Following the success of Pearl Harbor, Japanese Naval Command ordered the large submarines to make for the U.S. West Coast. The Japanese knew that the American public and military were nervous and jittery following the attack. Japanese submarines hunting close inshore off the California and Oregon coasts would further undermine American morale. A fear of some sort of Japanese landing on the West Coast was also widely believed by Americans at the time. Eight Japanese submarines hunted through to the end of December 1941. The Imperial Navy's 6th Fleet at k w a j a l i n had conceived a two part plan for these submarines. Vice Admiral Shimizu had ordered the submarines to interdict American merchant shipping and then to expend remaining deck gun ammunition against shore targets on the mainland of America. The submarines I 17, 19, 21, and 23 had all launched deck gun and torpedo attacks against American coastal merchantmen with hardly any successes. They sank two American tankers and damaged six more, all within sight of land, causing consternation out of all proportion to their successes. But interestingly, none of the Japanese had carried out shore bombardment as ordered. At the end of the year, the submarines returned to Japanese bases to refuel and rearm, and some were sent on other missions to Australia and New Zealand. But a handful returned to lie off the California coast. One of these vessels, the I 17, did determine to carry out the second part of the original orders and bombard the American coast, even though the Japanese Navy's chief of staff, Admiral Nagano cancelled the order he had issued to submarines as he feared retaliatory attacks on Japanese installations and towns. But it seems that Lieutenant Commander Nishino in the I 17 appears to have ignored his orders and to have proceeded with the original instructions to strike the shore. Question is why? The story of Nishino's attack on the Barnstall Oil Company's Elwood Refinery, located 10 miles north of Santa Barbara, California, appears rooted simply in a desire for personal revenge. During the late 1930s, Commander Nishino was a merchant seaman, captain of a Japanese oil tanker that had arrived at the Elwood Refinery's mile long row of derricks for unloading. Oil company executives invited Nishino and his crew to a welcoming ceremony north of the beach. As Nishino and his men made their way along a path from the beach, the proud Japanese sea captain had slipped and landed on top of a prickly pear cactus. Delighted American oil workers could not control themselves at the sight of Captain Nishino having cactus spines extracted from his backside. And Nishino's humiliation and loss of face was complete. It must also be remembered that in February 1942, Japan stood at the high watermark of her conquests. British Malaya had fallen, and the great naval base of Singapore had surrendered to the Japanese on the 15th of February, and 100,000 British, Australian, and Indian troops had fallen into Japanese hands. In Burma, the British were in retreat, conducting a fighting withdrawal through a thousand miles of hills and jungle. The 17th Indian Division was by February in serious danger of being cut off at the Sitang River, the British exit into the relative safety of India. The war was also going badly for the United States. General Douglas MacArthur's forces were bottled up in the Bataan Peninsula on the island of Luzon in the Philippines. And MacArthur himself had just been ordered to abandon his doomed command by no less than President Franklin Roosevelt himself and flee ignominiously to Australia. The American island of Wake had been in Japanese hands for two months. The Japanese were poised to launch an invasion of Java in the Netherlands' East Indies. 
one of the final frontiers of Allied resistance in the South before Australia. Perhaps personal reasons drove Nishino to disregard Admiral Nagano's orders and shell the American coast, and perhaps his decision was made in a moment of national euphoria as the expanding Japanese empire appeared unstoppable. They had a term for it. It was called victory disease. By February 1942, Nishino had returned to the area of his humiliation several years before, but this time commanding a well-armed and powerful submarine. On the evening of the 23rd of February, as the light disappeared from the sky, the Japanese submarine motored on the surface towards the giant refinery, its dozens of derricks fronting huge aviation fuel storage tanks situated on a hill behind the beach. Nishino stood on the Conning Tower Bridge, scanning the place he hated more than perhaps any other with binoculars, the deck gunners having already loaded their weapon with a 140mm shell. At exactly 7.15pm, Nishino ordered the gunners to commence firing. The first reports of the gun, which echoed across the mile or so of sea separating the submarine from the land, brought local residents and oil workers to their windows. Many workers rushed out of a popular local drinking hole, where they were relaxing after a hard day of labour. Confusion reigned after the impact of the first shell as people attempted to locate the source of the explosion. As the deck gun banged out for a second time, oil workers spotted the Japanese submarine sitting on the surface, out at sea, opposite the refinery. Workman G. O. Brown commenting afterwards that it was so big, I thought it might be a destroyer or a cruiser. Within minutes, the local police were informed of an enemy submarine boldly sitting on the surface, firing at the oil refinery. The local sheriff assured the callers that American aircraft were on their way to deal with the intruder. However, the American authorities would be unable to do very much about it, a fact not lost on Commander Nishino. Anywhere between 16 and 24 shells were fired by the I-17. Accounts vary. 11 were counted falling into the sea, while at least 3 struck and damaged rigging and pumping equipment at an oil head. Other shells passed over the refinery to land on ranches up to three miles from the coast. Nishino certainly came close to starting a major conflagration, as one shell exploded in a field only 30 yards from one of the giant aviation storage tanks. Suddenly, Nishino abruptly ordered the gunners to cease firing at 7.35 p.m., and the I-17 departed the scene on the surface, moving along the Santa Barbara Channel for the open sea. At the small town of Montecito, 16 miles east of Elwood, the Reverend Arthur Basham noticed the submarine heading south towards Los Angeles and flashing lights as if it were attempting to signal with the shore. The submarine was still reported to be motoring on the surface at 8.30 p.m. by local residents and Basham's report to local police fueled suspicions that Japanese Americans had been in communication with Nishino's boat and aided his locating targets. Reports of flashing lights out to sea off Santa Barbara led to the imposition of a blackout until just after midnight as local authorities feared further bombardments against shore communities. Nishino's attack though perhaps only serving as one man's lust for revenge, cannot be entirely dismissed as a freak event. The huge Elwood oil refinery was an important military and economic target, and had Nishino succeeded in setting fire to the aviation fuel stored there, he would have scored a significant victory. Commander Nishino made history by becoming the first person to successfully attack the mainland of the United States since the War of 1812 but more important by far was the fear and panic Nishino's audacious plans sparked off along the American West Coast. Many believed the United States was about to be invaded, coming so soon on the back of the successful Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor only three months before. What occurred in Los Angeles just days after the Elwood refinery attack demonstrated to everyone that invasion fears were widespread, and all that was required was a spark to ignite the entire coastal region. 
Following the I-17's successful deck gun bombardment to the Elwood oil refinery on the 23rd of February, US forces defending the West Coast were placed on high alert. Another scenario, apart from invasion, faced by the US authorities was a Japanese air raid on one or more of the large West Coast metropolises, such as Seattle, San Francisco, LA and San Diego. It was not beyond the realms of possibility that a Japanese carrier force could repeat the kind of mass aerial attack witnessed at Pearl Harbor, this time attempting to disrupt civilian life instead of destroying a military target not forgetting that all of these cities had a sizable U.S. Navy presence. Nishino's attack further undermined relations between white and Japanese Americans, which had already been severely eroded following the Pearl Harbor raid. In L.A., anti-aircraft guns and searchlights were standing ready to take on the Japanese. An alert system was operational, with 10,000 air raid wardens ready to take to the streets and army radar units carefully monitored their green scopes for a Japanese presence in the skies above the City of Angels. At 2.25 a.m. on the 25th of February, as most residents of L.A. slept soundly in their beds, an eerie sound grew across the city, heralding imminent danger. Hundreds of air raid sirens wailed through the still night air, triggered by the spark necessary to light the invasion fear touch paper, a radar contact recorded at slightly before 2 a.m. The blip on the radar screen was formally identified at 2.07 a.m. as an unidentified aircraft approaching the coast. Officers at 4th Interceptor Command tasked with defending LA from aerial attack, immediately posted a yellow alert. For 15 minutes, the unknown contact was tracked, still approaching LA, and as the aircraft did not deviate from its course, the alert status was upgraded to blue. A blue alert signified to military, civil defense and police authorities that the aircraft was presumed to be hostile. Following just three minutes later was the order to go to the red alert status. As far as the authorities were now concerned, an enemy air raid was imminent. Across the city, the mournful blaring of air raid sirens continued to awake residents. Searchlight beams stabbed out into the night sky, the city was blacked out, and anti-aircraft batteries reported themselves manned and ready to 4th Interceptor Command headquarters. Thousands of air raid wardens and police officers took to the streets to assist the military. By 2.32, all anti-aircraft batteries and searchlight units had completed reporting their status. The anti-aircraft weapons employed by 4th Interceptor Command were 37mm cannon and larger 3-inch guns. The combined number of guns within LA could place 48 flak shells into the sky every minute, creating a perilous curtain of fire for any would-be bombers to penetrate. At 3.16 a.m., all anti-aircraft guns suddenly commenced firing, hundreds of shells exploding like some crazed fireworks display high above the city. So the guns ceased firing at 3.36. Searchlights continued to trace bright patterns across the sky when suddenly at 4.05 the flak guns recommenced firing. At 4.15, silence once more returned to the city as the batteries ceased their blind hammering of the empty sky. Thirty minutes of sustained anti-aircraft fire had hulled approximately 1,440 rounds of both 37mm and 3-inch ammunition into the air above Los Angeles, equating to a massive 10 tons of ordnance. Most of the shells had exploded at their preset altitudes, some had not. Either way, ten tons of expended shrapnel and unexploded shells now fell back onto the city below. Some of the larger three-inch shells that had failed to explode in mid-air detonated instead when they began impacting all over LA. Houses and garages were damaged as white-hot shards of shrapnel ripped through homes, often narrowly missing terrified residents. 
As the sun came up later that morning, army bomb disposal teams were at work all over the city, roping off streets from curious bystanders before making safe American three-inch shells that had buried themselves in roads and gardens without exploding. Incredibly, only nine citizens of L.A. had died during the air raid, most from heart attacks or accidents in the blackout. At the North American Aviation Factory Complex located at Inglewood, brand new B-25 Mitchell bombers were discovered with wings peppered by falling shrapnel. More serious was the metaphorical fallout of the air raid in the treatment of California's Japanese-American community. Several days prior to the Phantom Raid on L.A., President Roosevelt had issued Executive Order 9066. This law required the enforced internment of all Japanese Americans for the duration of the conflict in, quote, concentration camps, unquote, outside the city. During the night of the air raid, police, who believed them to have been signalling to enemy aircraft with lights, arbitrarily arrested dozens of Japanese Americans. Most of these people were only guilty of driving a car during a blackout or other minor infractions of the law. Questions began almost as soon as the last flak shell exploded. Did the Japanese attack LA on the 25th of February 1942? The answer is an emphatic no. Reporters arrived at a ludicrous figure of 50 enemy aircraft over the city during the air raid, the American military provided some face-saving evidence with which to prove that an attack had indeed taken place. For example, the 122nd Coast Artillery Regiment, guarding an aircraft factory at Downey, identified several aircraft flying beyond the maximum range of their guns, but fired at them anyway. At Long Beach, Battery G, 78th Coast Artillery Regiment, protecting the Douglas Aircraft Factory, logged 25 to 30 enemy bombers, followed half an hour later by another 15, all flying in formation. This battery fired 246 three-inch shells into the sky, claiming the mystery bombers then moved out to sea. Officially, at least, the Japanese did launch an attack on L.A., according to the U.S. Army, after receiving several reports from anti-aircraft batteries. The Army settled on a tentative estimate of 15 enemy aircraft over the city between 2.30 and 4.30 a.m. This raises an obvious question. 15 aircraft could only have come from a Japanese aircraft carrier, and a detailed search undertaken the next day failed to demonstrate a Japanese naval presence in inshore West Coast waters, submarines not included. In the light of this news, the authorities changed their story, stating that the 15 aircraft reported were most probably of civilian origin, and had been, conveniently, piloted by enemy agents. On the 26th of February, the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, completely undermined the Army statements when he declared that the air raid on L.A. had been a false alarm. The U.S. Army continued to defend its original assertion for some time, eventually requiring congressional intervention, perhaps unwilling to accept the embarrassment of having been firing at phantoms rather than Japanese bombers on the night of the 25th of February. No evidence has ever been produced to prove that the Japanese did raid L.A. No bomb damage was recorded anywhere in the city, no planes were downed by anti-aircraft fire, and no one has ever come forward to say that they participated in the raid, Japanese pilot or enemy agent. So what were the gunners actually firing at? False radar returns was one possibility. Weather balloons was another. Some had been released nearby, and one air raid warden even described a balloon being hit and bursting into flames. Another suggestion has been a large alien spacecraft. The UFO story originated with a doctored photo of something caught in searchlight beams over LA that night. If it was aliens, we should commend their forbearance in not vaporising La La Land after such a welcome. Japanese submarines were very real, however, and all Americans living in California and Oregon knew that the enemy was close. What the Phantom LA air raid perhaps demonstrated above all else was the fears of invasion and attack Americans were living with in early 1942, and the competence of the civil defence and anti-aircraft units whose job was to protect the city.
They did their job on the night of the 25th of February and stood ready to protect the city from any future Japanese attack. Commander Nishino and the I-17 remained at their assigned patrol area after the attack on the Elwood oil refinery. The 28th of February, five days after the shore bombardment, and three following the phantom Japanese air raid on LA, Nishino struck again. Lookouts located the tanker William A. Berg, and Nishino shot a single torpedo at the American ship. Fortunately for the merchant seamen, the Japanese torpedo detonated prematurely, but Nishino believed that he had struck the tanker. The William A. Berg escaped damaged and made off from the scene of her close brush with disaster. The invasion scare was over for the time being, but the Japanese would return to the west coast in summer 1942 to shell shore targets and even launch an aerial assault. But that story is for another time. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share. You can also visit my other YouTube channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can help support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.